Execution scheduled for 11 p.m. But he's trying to convince us he's gone insane. And therefore incapable of being executed. I need you to prove he's faking it. Edward? I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm not Edward. I'm a demon. Demons aren't really a thing. And give me something to make me believe you. Prove to me you're a demon. Probably just a coincidence. Last night I rented the movie Nefarious. And I was incredibly hesitant for a number of reasons. First of all, it costs $20 to rent, at least on YouTube. And so I said, I don't even know if I'd want to buy this movie because I heard that it was somewhat Christian related. Now, as all of you know, I'm a diehard Christian, but Christian movies, not so much. I like a few of them, but for the most part, I'm completely against the <laughs> um, uh, most of the campy sort of nature of Christian films. It doesn't seem like they're rooted in real life. They try to be too um, otherworldly, too nice. They try to appease their audience too much, I believe, But which is good and bad, and there's all types of a discussion for that. But either way, say about a quarter of the way through the movie, I was just captivated by it. It immediately, uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, this guy, he completely draws you in. It's almost hypnotic, his performance. And I had heard about how it's Oscar worthy and all of that. And some of you may remember him from Boondock Saints from way back in the day and all of this. Well, completely turned over a new leaf, now making Christian content. And I must say, this isn't a movie review, but it did get me to thinking. As for the movie itself, absolutely brilliant. As far as him being on the screen, I thought that by the end, no spoilers, but I thought that by the end, you know, it's very underwhelming. It gets very campy by the end and you're like, okay, yeah. And you're just kind of wanting it to get over with by that point. But, but once again, no spoilers, fantastic performance by Sean Patrick Flannery. The entire premise behind the movie Nefarious is there's this man, he's about to be executed. He's just got a few hours left to be executed. He's on death row. He's a horrible serial killer. And um, they bring in this psychiatrist to see if he's crazy. And he claims that he's demon possessed. And the whole movie is trying to, you know, you're kind of going back and forth. Is he really demon possessed or is he just a genius master manipulator or whatnot? And this brings up the topic at hand today. Do demons really influence people to commit evil? Now, that's a very is an obvious answer to Christians. Yes, absolutely. But I'm not really speaking to my Christian audience today because the Bible is very plain. Yes, there are demons. They tempt people to do evil. They wish to kill, steal, destroy, take over the whole universe, the planet, whatever, gain power and destroy all naysayers and keep whatever followers that they may have and all of this. But let's first examine real world serial killers. Right here is one in whom changed his name to Pazuzu, a demon of sorts that he figured out from the movie The Exorcist. This is the Pazuzu Algarod you know. He legally changed his name from John Lawson to Pazuzu Algarod. Pazuzu, a demon featured in The Exorcist. <laughs> Cynthia says he didn't worship the devil. Instead, a dragon, as she put it, named Tiamat. Homemade tattoos on his face developed from this, to this, to this. He filed his teeth to points. But that was one of the first ones he did, and you can just see the anger coming out. In February of 2006, at the age of 27, Pazuzu went to Daymark Recovery Services. Records show he was diagnosed with agoraphobia, an anxiety disorder centered around fearing or avoiding places that might cause you to feel panic. He left after two months, then returned again in October of 2008. Within the next year is when Cynthia says she was in the home as Pazuzu and his spiritual wife, Amber Birch, killed Joshua Wetzler and Tommy Dean Welch. Deputies got their second search warrant for Pazuzu's home. 
This went on for a matter of weeks. After arresting Pazuzu and Amber and days of digging, collecting every shred of evidence they could, the scene was released, with deputies only going back to guard it out of fear people would go there on Halloween. As neighbors erupted in cheers, a track hoe flattened the home piece by piece. Dust, debris gathered for years, floated off into the blue spring sky. We'll probably never know what all took place in that house. In the meantime, Azuzu had attempted to commit suicide in the Forsyth County Detention Center. Transferred to Central Prison in Raleigh for safekeeping, where he continued to write his mother letters. And he said, Mom, I just can't take it anymore. Until October 26th, 2015, when he wrote the very last one. This was two days before he died. It was October 26th, 2015. From Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, Pazuzu Algarod sent his mother, Cynthia, this letter. He always said, Mom, of course, and Shakamuku, which means what's up in Arabic. And he says, I'm so bored. Got a letter from you and one from Amber. I despise the human race. People are ugly and pointless creatures. I sit back and watch them and they anger me. I should get a medal for murdering these stupid <laughs> Maybe when I'm dead, the gods of chaos shall grant me the power. Two days later, he was dead. Ruled a suicide, his cause of death, blood loss from a deep wound to a major blood vessel in his left arm. The autopsy revealing tattoos that had largely gone unseen to the public, some reading Pazuzu, Lucifer, Satan, Villain, 666, Joker, live fast and die. And then there's the infamous serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, was an American serial killer and sex offender who killed and dismembered 17 males between 1978 and 1991. And much like Pazuzu, Jeffrey Dahmer also had a strange obsession with the movie Exorcist, but part three. Did that room have a TV set in it? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. There was an Exorcist movie on? Yeah. Do you know which one of them? Uh, the name, I'm not sure. I think it's three. I'm not sure which one. Right. So there was a movie. Did you know it to be part of television or VCR? Uh, VCR, normally that's not on regular television, so I thought it was VCR. You knew there was a movie show. Right. Did you see him put it on, or was it on? No. When we first got into the apartment, he went through the back, to the back bedroom. Maybe he put it on then, I'm not sure. Okay. As you were sitting there on the bed, when he had you by the handcuff and a knife at your side, what impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation that you observed of Mr. Dahmer? At times he wasn't himself, and then at times he was, was like a nice guy, you know? He would come and go different times, you know, throughout the whole time. Then he would like sit, being quiet at times, watching a movie, wanting me to watch the movie, you know, and just doing little tanning sounds, you know? Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? Right, he would like this start rocking back and forth when he, you know, certain parts of the movie or whatever. And you have to say, what did he say, man? It was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth, right? Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? Uh, I'm not even sure, sir, but it was just like, I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It was like a slow slur, like, mm, some of that nature, some close like that, I'm not sure. Did it keep on for a period of time? Off and on throughout the ordeal. Was there any parts of the movie that was going on that you saw that he said anything about? It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that had got possessed and that, uh, and that uh, it would seem like he was like interested in that part. That part had his attention more than anything. Like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part, you know, being demonized or whatever in that nature. And there are so many other serial killers that we can reference right now whom claim to be either empowered by Satan, working for Lucifer, what have you. But let's now briefly examine another area of society, and that is gang members. 
We have MS-13 and whom Satanism runs rampant with these gangs. As you'll see, they recruit very young and they're very fond of the devil horns, which is also quite common in the music industry, where you'll find on a constant basis this Satanism running throughout the industry, the entertainment industry. And if it's not outright Satanism, it's mockery of God or Christ. Notice they never hardly mock any other religious figure, only Christ. Right there, you saw Lady Gaga in her Judas video mocking the crown of thorns. But right here, you see Ariana Grande during a live television performance mocking The Last Supper. There's also little Uzi Vert, whose pink tape recently, very recently, just became the first rap album in 2023 to hit number one. Little Uzi Vert is believed by many to just be a broken up way to say Lucifer. And this young man is very open about his anti-God stance. I actually have an entire series called Devil's Puppets that I had to remove from YouTube and place on my archive.org and Rumble accounts because YouTube's very sensitive about some of that and they'll, they'll hit you with strikes for little to no reason. So you can go and watch my exposés on these, like Ariana Grande, Billie Eilish, Lil Uzi Vert, Megan Fox, Rihanna, Seth MacFarlane, all of these, and I'll leave the link in the description to show you Satanism in full display by these entertainers. Now let's go to the movie industry. There are films and TV series like the series Lucifer and films like that of Along Came the Devil and all of these in which blatantly promote Satanism, darkness, the occult. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, all of that is just for shock value, well, now let's get into the political spectrum. Back in the day, we know how people worship these idols, these sticks and stones and trees and all of this formed into whatever figures. And you would think that's antiquated and that never happens anymore, except in like Hinduism and whatnot, where they still obviously and Catholicism. But even in the political realm, we hear about these secret societies as well as Bohemian Grove out in California and how there are senators and world leaders and big bankers and these rich people. They meet up in these secret places like Bohemian Grove. Just Google it and you'll be just astonished about how they show up. And this is the actual image where... This is a Moloch statue in which they perform these bizarre rituals in front of, just like the days of old. The most talked about film out right now is called The Sound of Freedom, July 4th film. It's about the children who are trafficked. And here's an actual stat for you. At this very moment, it's estimated that over 3 million children are being victimized in sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Three million. This isn't just a few children around the world going missing, a few hundred or something. Millions and millions, and those are just the ones that we know about. Oftentimes, atheists, they'll bring up how much evil that there is in the world. And they'll say, well, how can there be a God if there's so much evil? Well, I think I told an atheist one time, I said, well, look, if, if you don't want to see the good that's going on in the world and how it's a miracle babies being born and the love that you share between your family and your friends and all of this, if you can't see that, then surely you know that there's an evil pervading the whole earth. Whenever Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and fasted and was tempted by Satan at the end, Satan approaches him and the very last temptation that he offers Christ is, he says, if you'll bow down to me, he says, I'll give you all the world, all the kingdoms, all the power. Jesus, you haven't got to wait thousands and thousands of years to rule over this world. I'll let you rule over it right now. Jesus never does look at the devil and say to him, well, you don't own this world. You don't have, it's not yours to give. He never does say that. What does he say? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now that tells us that biblically speaking, Satan has ownership over this world. So he can. And if you don't believe in demons and you claim to be a Christian, you don't know your Bible. Because Jesus blatantly tells us there are demons, there is a devil over them, and they tempt you night and day to do evil constantly to try to drag you away from the Lord. 
So I would just like to have all of you unbelievers look at the world as it is and to think to yourself, is there really a some some kind of bizarre, far more complex mind behind the evil that we're seeing in this world? Satan's influence being everywhere. You hear about him everywhere in the highest upper echelons of all society, the music industry, the movie industry, politics. You see evil running rampant all over, child sex trafficking, serial killers telling you that the devil is telling them to kill people. So once again, all I'm asking is take a second, sit back and think for just one minute and to think, is could there possibly be something or someone behind all of this evil going on? What happened to Edward? We own him. We? 